We're going to be focusing on seeing the, learning to see the light, identify color systems, and I wanted to start off with that old favorite quote of mine that I know y'all have heard before. In nature, light creates the color. In the picture, color creates the light. This is one of Hans Hoffman's sayings, and it, it to me is a prime descriptor of the process that we're going to be going through over the course of this time that we're going to be spending together. We need to understand first how light creates that color as we look at it in order to then be able to use color to create the illusion of that light. So we're going to begin to scratch the surface of that very, very deep and complex issue right here today. So what we're going to cover are four approaches to color, four different color systems that artists use to deal with color in painting, four key qualities of light that affect color, the four different aspects of light that affect the way that we perceive color as we're looking at objects, and four tips for learning to see color, so ways to put that into action. So let's jump right into those four approaches to color. Now there's some others that I've heard people list out there, but these to me are four overarching groups that we're going to look at that you can use to describe or categorize most of the approaches that painters take to using color. So let's start with the first, local, then optical, arbitrary and symbolic. Local and optical are the two that we're going to concentrate on the most, but I want to go on and define all four for you, kind of roughly, before we go into a little bit more depth on those first two. So keep in mind that local and optical are the ones we're most concerned about here, but we're also just going to briefly cover what arbitrary and symbolic are. So local, remember, is that physical color of the object, the actual color of the object. Optical is the way, the color that our eye perceives as it looks at light falling across that object. So it's that light that creates the color that Hoffman was talking about. It's sometimes called observational color. Arbitrary color is more of an intuitive approach to color. And it's certainly the kind of color systems that most abstract artists are using. So when you paint in an abstract manner and you put one color down and then you choose another color based on how it's going to relate to that first color, or you make some sort of kind of intuitive decision about that, that's an example of an arbitrary color system. The fourth one, symbolic has to do with color standing in for something else. Expressive color is a kind of symbolic color. Certainly a number of early non-objective artists uh, like Kandinsky believed that color inherently had some symbolic qualities to it. But symbolic color is used by artists to convey a specific mood or idea or emotion rather than to describe the, what they saw. So that's how it's mainly different. We're not talking about what we've seen with our eyes. So let's go back to local color for a minute. Local color, the physical color of the object. It's the color system that most artists start out with. And when you are using local color in a painting, when you add the create the light colors, the light values of a color, you're going to add white to it, and when you create the darker values, you're going to add black. And here is an example of just that. And here you can see a version of that rendered in local color. You can tell in local color that the color is not as intense. It's a color system that's based just on value relationships. So it does convey a sense of light, it does convey a sense of illumination, but it's somewhat limited. So it's a very basic form. 
As soon as you add that white to make a color lighter, you're diluting and dulling it down. As soon as you add black, you're again diluting it and dulling it down. So you kill some of the sense of light by using local color. So we are going to try to explore instead using optical color, observational color, also sometimes called perceptual color. All of that refers to the fact that optical color is based on what our eye perceives rather than the actual physical color. So optical color is the way, the color that the light has created as it falls across an object. It's the color that a light has created, that the light has created as it falls across an object. And when you're mixing for creating um, optical color, you need to remember that the same hue cannot be used for both the highlight and the shadow. And I know y'all have heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. When you're mixing three different values of a color using optical color, you choose the color you're going to start with, and then you add a lighter, inherently lighter color, equally intense, to lighten the color up and you add an inherently darker color that's equally intense to darken it up. Look on the color wheel. Identify a color that's fairly close by to the color you're working with that fits that bill. So here's an example of that same building again, that building in sunlight, but the painting on the right was done using optical color. And it is a much, much richer uh, painting as a result. The strong, the sense of illumination is much stronger than it would have been if it were in local color. The second thing I want you to think about as we talk about uh, these topics are the four key qualities of light that affect color. So we talked about those two color systems that we're really looking at a little bit more in depth and then we're going to talk about the different kinds of light and how light affects colors. I'm going to give you just a little taste of this on the four key qualities of light so that it's not too much to swallow at one time. So those four key qualities are angle, direction, diffused or direct, and the color of the light. So it's important to understand the angle of the light, the direction of the light, whether it's diffused or direct, and what the color of the light is. And I think the easiest way to understand these things is for us to look at a couple of photographs and paintings so that you can see how the light is uh, reflected in those particular images. And I think it makes much more clear sense at that point. So let's go back to that building and sunlight photograph. The angle of the light is the angle of the sun in relationship to the earth. So this photograph was taken later in the afternoon between 3 and 5 o'clock. So the light was at a fairly low angle. It was in the fall, in the late fall. And so the light was at a fairly low angle. That's going to give you a very, very different quality of light. And it affects some of those other qualities down below. The direction of the light is important. And the direction, although it sounds similar to the angle, the direction is what direction is the light? How is the light positioned in relationship to the subject? So in this case, the light is in front of the subject. So the light is in front of the building. It is over the shoulder of the photographer, behind the photographer. So you need to know where the light's coming from. So you need to know the angle. You need to know where the light's coming from. Is it diffused or direct? Diffused means that the light beams are scattered and broken up. So think foggy morning, rainy afternoon, anything that's going to break up the direction of the light, anything that's going to break up what they call the specularity of the light, that's going to make it more diffused. 
If it's direct, it's going to be strong and hard. If it's diffused, it's going to be soft. So we want to think about whether it's diffused and soft or direct and hard. When you look at this building, it is very sharp and very clear light. That is an example of direct, hard light. The fourth part of color that you need to think about is my fourth part of light is the color of the light. And for the most part, in the, over the course of this time we have together, we're going to be looking at outdoor light. But light itself has a color. So light can create a color, but light has a color itself. So if you're thinking about time of day and time of year, that can affect the color of the light. Early morning light, late afternoon light tends to be more warm, more golden. Noonday light tends to be more white. So early and late is more yellow, more warm. And noon directly overhead is more white. If you're inside, the light can be warm if you're using tungsten lights, or it can be cool if you've got fluorescence. So light itself, the thing that's beaming it out, can have a color, and that's going to affect what your eye sees as that colored light falls across the object. So in this painting, look again at the angle and see if you can figure out what it is. It's another example of a lower light situation. It's morning rather than afternoon, but it's a fairly early morning. And the light is falling at a fairly low angle. The direction is again over the shoulder of the photographer, but instead of being directly behind the photographer and shining straight on the subject, it's over to the side. So the, the light is shining in from the far right-hand side. So the direction is at an angle, or it's at a, a more of a side light instead of frontal light. It's not backlit over the whole thing, although there is some backlighting going on. If you look at that far right-hand side in the area where those dark purpley trees are, those are in shadow. They're backlit. And as the light falls across the tip top of those trees, those trees change color. Diffused or direct? This is direct light. It's not diffused at all. It's very strong, clear, direct light. The color of the light was somewhat warm, but it's not very early morning, so it's moving towards being more clear white light. This one was done in the early morning on a very stormy, rainy day. So let's think about these four different keys that refer to light. The angle. It's a little hard to tell from just looking at the painting, but the angle appears to be fairly low. And you can tell that by looking at the shadows. And it was. It was very early in the morning, so the sun was very low in relationship to the earth. The direction of the light was, is to the left and back, over the left shoulder of the artist and photographer who was shooting the photograph and the artist who was painting the painting, because this is a, a plein air. Then it is also very diffused. It was a very, very rainy morning. <clears throat> there were storms moving in from the west, so there was no direct light. It was very diffused light, and it's very broken up, so the contrast is much, much lower rather than being higher. So it's an example of diffused light. The color of the light is almost blue because of the cloud formations and reflections off of the water. But the, the cloud formations, the particles in the sky, were coloring the light as it came down. So the angle is low and to the left. The direction 
to the left. It's diffused and it's got blue light. A very cool light. This is a cropped section of a painting and it's in a very, very different kind of landscape. It is in the middle of the Congaree Swamp and the Congaree National Park. Heavy, heavy canopy overhead, middle of summertime. So there is a lot of foliage between the area that was being painted and the sky overhead, even though you can see some sky in there. So if we run through those four aspects again, the angle is actually fairly high in the sky. It was moving towards uh, 11 o'clock to almost noon. So the sun is almost perpendicular. The direction of the light actually becomes a little hard to tell. It's one of the things that can happen with diffused light is there's not as much of a clear direction. And it is somewhat diffused because of all the foliage. So the direction of the light is a little unclear and a little broken up because of how diffused it is. The color of the light is fairly white, slightly cool because of the light passing through all of those leaves, all of that foliage it does tend to tint it a little bit to the greeny blue side. This one is another plein air sketch and if you look closely you can even see the little accompanying gnats that were there that day. Not too bad but a few and it was a beach in California. Done very quickly because there was a lot of wind, high high wind um, and it was hold, hard to hold on to the panel. So it's a very different kind of lighting situation than these others that we've already looked at. The angle of the light, the sun was high in the sky, very high in the sky. It started painting at about one o'clock in the afternoon. So it's fairly high in the sky. The direction of the light was almost straight behind me, but slightly up into the sky because the angle of the light is so high, it's behind me, shining directly onto the subject, almost frontal light. It is most definitely direct light. It's very strong light. It's not diffused at all. And the color of the light was very crisp, very clear, and very white. So very, very white light. So we've looked at several very different lighting situations, and I hope that makes those four key as qualities or aspects of light a little bit more apparent. And let's run back through those again, just to look at some of those images, and then refresh our memories about angle, direction, Diffused or direct, and the color of the light. So there's four aspects. Finally, I want to talk about four tips for learning to see color. So we've talked about color systems, and we're striving to move from local to optical. We've talked about the four key qualities of light and how that affect color. And now I want to talk about some ways to start really practicing seeing those things when they're in front of you. So these four tips are four really concrete ways you can start practicing that art of learning to see color. Step number one, one of the most important ones up there, relax. Step number two, spend more time looking than painting. Step number three, use your peripheral vision. And step number four, use a color spot tool. So I want to go through all four of these in a little bit more detail and how you can use them, how they'll benefit you. 
relaxing sounds a little bit obvious, but when you are first starting to see color, you need to move from being very left-brained to be very right-brained. And relaxation is one of the key things that can trigger that switch. So we're moving from painting what we know to painting what we see. And in order to let go of those preconceptions, to, or in order to be able to let go at all, we have to be relaxed. So you can physically shake yourself out. If you shake your hands and then shake your feet, that helps to relax your body. And once you relax your body, you'll begin to relax your mind and your eyes. You can do things like uh, putting your hands over your eyes and surprising yourself with what you're looking at. You may feel silly the first time you do it, but if you want to see or perceive something differently in a more relaxed way, try blocking your vision with your, the palms of your hands, then pulling them away quickly so that your mind doesn't have time to process the objects. And in the process of relaxing, and then triggering that altered view, you'll see way more color than you did before. Spend more time looking than painting. This is one of the reasons that I mix my color ahead of time. If I am mixing my color ahead of time, I am doing an awful lot of observing and looking and looking and observing. And in the process of doing that, I learn a lot about what it is that I'm planning to paint. So spend the time it takes to really look and observe. Even look and observe without a pencil, pen, brush, uh, colored pencil, crayon, marker, or anything in your hand. Trust your eyes to remember what they've seen, but spend more time looking than painting. That's a really key thing to do right now. Another trick to be able to see the color is to use your peripheral vision. So try looking at something just to the right of the color area that you're trying to analyze. If you look at something just to the right of that, that area that you're trying to identify will be in your peripheral vision and you'll be able to see and perceive the color much more easily. Last, use a color spot tool. And I've taught, at least in my blog and I think in previous webinars, a number of times about color spot tools. They are so easy to make. You can buy ones online, and that's great if you want to spend the money. They're not really that much better than what you can make yourself. All you need is about a 2 by 3 inch uh, rectangle of cardstock, something like thin mat board, even poster board will work. And then take a hole punch, stick it in as far up as you can onto that piece of cardstock, and punch a hole. Look through that color spot tool to identify the color in that color mass that you're looking at. I want you to start looking at color masses rather than things. And to do that, you need to be able to identify the overall color of that mass. Not just the value, but the hue. And using a color spot tool to look through will help you do that. So one of the things that I want you to do before you move on to the demo exercises is to come make yourself one of those color spot tools. They're very handy. So let's just look at this photograph that was in the webinar as well again and think about the colors that we actually see here and try using some of those tools that we've been talking about. So in order to more accurately see the color of the grasses, 
look at that very distant shed in the way far back towards the right hand side uh, at the horizon line. Very distant shed. You really can't see anything but the roof line. Look at that. Kind of focus your attention on that. When you do that, you'll begin to see how orange the grass in the foreground truly is. And how blue-green those shadow areas of the grass are. So there's an awful lot of color in the foreground that you would miss if you didn't use your peripheral vision. So think about the kind of light. And you can tell a lot of that from just looking at the photograph. It's late afternoon, early evening. The sun is going down. This was about three weeks ago, two weeks ago. And the winter wheat was ripening and getting ready to be harvested. And it was full on huge big pods of wheat and the sun, late afternoon sun was hitting it and turning it pinkish orange. So the angle of the sky of the sun is very low and the, the sun is directly behind me so it's hitting straight on full frontal light. It's not from the side, it's not from the back, it's from the front and it is strong, hard, direct light and the color of the light it's just slightly golden because of the time of day. I also love this quote from Hawthorne. Hawthorne was taking some of the ideas of the Impressionists and bringing them to painters in America back at the beginning of the 20th century. And he said, think of color instead of sand. Think of color instead of clothes. Color first and house after, not house first and color after. So think about that quote in terms of this photograph. This was taken just about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and on the, the Georgia sea coast. And it's a beach scene. We've seen a million of them. All of us have. But instead of thinking about sand, let's do as Hawthorne suggested and think about color. Think about the gradual transition and gradations of color as you move from high sand on the left that's not catching as strong a light to the sand as it gradually angles down and is catching more light to where it cools off as the water hits it and it reflects more of the sky overhead to the dark blue of the sea. Sand last, color first. So what we've covered today are four different approaches or color systems. Talked about how we're going to move from local to more optical color. Really reinforce what we learned in Composition color and light about optical color. Dig deeper into that. Four key qualities of light that affect color. And four tips for learning to see color. So now I want you to take action. I want you to do the work and make it real. So your assignment for this next assignment for this module, practice seeing optical color. Practice that observation. I want you to practice recognizing the type of light. And I want you to make a color spot tool and practice using it. Notice the practice word coming up a lot. Practice, practice, practice. Most of what I'm talking about here is practicing looking, practicing observation. I want you, before you move to the next lesson, to practice seeing the color around you. Practicing color in photographs, practicing it in the objects, figures, and the landscapes that are surrounding you. Make that color spot tool and practice using it so you don't feel funky with it in your hand. Take care and happy painting.